We'll discuss the value of ultrasound when assessing the gallbladder and bile ducts. We'll identify the imaging features of acute conditions of the gallbladder and complications. We'll recognize some common pitfalls to avoid misinterpretation. And we'll very briefly discuss a number of conditions, including primary sclerosing cholangitis, cholangiocarcinoma, IgG4-associated cholangitis, adenomyomatosis, gallbladder polyps, and finally, a case or two of gallbladder cancer. What is the primary imaging modality used to assess the patient with acute pain in the right upper quadrant? Is it ultrasound, computed tomography, magnetic resonance imaging, or scintigraphy with HIDA? The answer, of course, is ultrasound. Now, when patients present to the emergency department with right upper quadrant pain, finding the cause is a clinical challenge. And if you base your diagnosis solely on clinical evaluation and a few simple laboratory tests, you will be inaccurate a large number of times. So imaging is critical to management, and in my opinion, ultrasound should always be the initial imaging investigation for these patients. It's accurate, it's safe, it's inexpensive, it's available, and today it's highly portable. When patients present to the emergency room with right upper quadrant pain, they invariably come to our department with a requisition that states rule out acute cholecystitis. But in fact, less than two-thirds of these patients will actually have acute cholecystitis. And there's a whole range of other conditions, including cholecystitis, cholangitis, recurrent pyogenic cholangiohepatitis, liver abscess, rupture of liver masses, to name a few, that can mimic the presentation of acute cholecystitis. Ultrasound has an accuracy of about 88% in the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. This is very similar to scintigraphy, but ultrasound has advantages in that not only can it diagnose acute cholecystitis, but it can demonstrate complications such as gangrenous change or perforation, and it can also offer alternate diagnosis when the gallbladder is normal. It's also less time consuming. The majority of patients with acute cholecystitis have gallstones, and the pathophysiology is calculus obstruction of the gallbladder neck and cystic duct, leading to gallbladder distension and then variable degrees of infection and necrosis, all the while the patient's developing right upper quadrant pain, tenderness and guarding, and the spectrum of presentation is quite large from relatively mild symptoms to very dramatic findings. The most sensitive ultrasound findings when diagnosing acute cholecystitis are maximal tenderness over the sonographically localized gallbladder in the presence of gallstones in the correct clinical setting. And we've known this for a number of years, a paper by Phil Riles back in the mid-80s in a prospective study of close to 500 patients showed that this combination of findings had a positive predictive value of greater than 90%. Gallbladder distension, diffuse wall thickening, pericholecystic uh, fluid are secondary findings that are neither sensitive nor specific. But one finding I'd like to draw attention to is gallbladder distension and give you this teaching pearl. Be very reluctant to diagnose acute, uncomplicated cholecystitis if the gallbladder is not tensely distended. I find that a very useful rule in everyday practice. So here's our patient, a woman in her late 30s with right upper quadrant pain for approximately 22 hours. And we can see immediately that there are gallstones and there was maximal tenderness over the sonographically localized gallbladder. So in that context, a positive predictive value of greater than 90% for acute cholecystitis. Note also that this gallbladder is tensely distended. Note that the wall is not thickened, 
and we don't see pericholocystic fluid. So that shouldn't put you off the diagnosis. It's also very valuable, I find, when I go into the room to look specifically for the region of the gallbladder, neck, and cystic duct to see if I can demonstrate the obstructing stone. Because if I can, it adds additional confidence to my diagnosis. If I can't, it doesn't put me off if the other features are there. But I'm even more confident if I can demonstrate that stone. Another patient, a very similar history, we see immediately there are gold stones. There was maximal tenderness over the sonographically localized gallbladder. The gallbladder is tensely distended. In this case, there is gallbladder wall edema. So we can make a diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. But again, pay attention to the region of the gallbladder neck and cystic duct. And sometimes you have to work a little harder. So this is with the patient left posterior oblique. We've moved the probe up intercostal, and now we've unfolded the gallbladder neck and cystic duct, and we can demonstrate the obstructing stone. It adds confidence to our diagnosis. Remember that today, most gallbladders are removed laparoscopically, whether it's an elective cholecystectomy or in an acute setting. And we must always keep in the back of our mind the possibility of an underlying gallbladder cancer. Because if a surgeon removes a gallbladder laparoscopically and there is a cancer, and it's not foremost in their mind that there might be a cancer, it can have a bad outcome. This patient is three months post laparoscopic cholecystectomy. There was a non-suspected gallbladder cancer in the specimen, and now we have seeding at the right upper quadrant port site and at the periumbilical port site. So when this patient, a retired obstetrician, presented one morning with acute right upper quadrant pain, we could see the gallbladder stones. We, could have, we had maximal tenderness over the sonographically localized gallbladder. The gallbladder is distended. So I was very confident that there was acute cholecystitis, but I was concerned about this additional material in the gallbladder lumen. Is it tumor fact of sludge, or is it a tumor? We could use contrast ultrasound here, but this patient had a multi-phase CT. This high attenuation was present on the unenhanced images, so simply represents the gold stones. We can see a thin, smooth, enhancing gallbladder mucosa. There's some early gangrenous change, and there's pericholocystic inflammatory change, but no enhancing tumor mass. So we were very confident that all the changes in this case were due to inflammation, and the patient went on and had a non-eventful cholecystectomy. So what about gangrenous cholecystitis? It's not uh, uncommon. Uh, you should look for asymmetric thickening of the gallbladder wall and intraluminal membranes from sloughing of the mucosa. Remember that the majority of patients with time will have a negative sonographic Murphy sign, and the symptoms and signs will shift away from the right upper quadrant. So often it's a very confusing clinical presentation. Here's an example, a man who had pain for eight to nine days came to emergency and had a renal colic CT scan uh, for what I suspect was fairly nonspecific abdominal pain. There were no urinary tract calculi, but we did note a distended gallbladder, and when you look carefully, there's a high attenuation line within the gallbladder lumen on this unenhanced scan. We brought the patient immediately to ultrasound, and we see the sloughed uh, mucosa giving you intraluminal membranes. You see this asymmetric wall thickening, which allows you make that diagnosis of gangrenous cholecystitis. It's also a distended gallbladder with a fluid debris level within it. Gallbladder perforation is the next uh, step in the process, and it's a very significant uh, step. Again, not uncommon, 5 to 10 percent of uh, cases of acute cholecystitis, depending on the uh, series, and it's significant because it can have a significant mortality rate. It comes really in three flavors, an acute perforation, where you get a generalized peritonitis, and then a subacute 
which uh, allows the process, the omentum comes up and walls off the inflammatory process and you get a pericholocystic abscess. And then more chronic uh, uh, perforation where the gallbladder sticks on to an adjacent structure, be it the duodenum or the colon, and you can get an internal biliary fistula, sometimes with passage of stones. Here's a case of a patient with pain for just over a week. Uh, we see this large gallstone in the region of the gallbladder neck, but there's an additional process here in segment five of uh, the liver. And when we look at that more closely, uh, this patient was septic, it has all the features of a liver abscess, and then we return and we look more carefully at the gallbladder, and we can actually see the point of perforation in grayscale. Uh, note that this gallbladder isn't distended, and that's because it's perforated and decompressed itself, so that distensibility rule doesn't work well once the gallbladder has perforated. And CT gives a very nice overview and has a similar sensitivity for demonstrating the point of perforation in the gallbladder wall. Emphysematous cholecystitis, thankfully, is rare gas-forming bacteria. Often gallstones are absent. A little over one-third of patients will be diabetic, more common in men than women, and an important condition because of its high gangrene and perforation rates and therefore high morbidity and potentially high mortality rates. This is a nice example where we see a very echogenic gallbladder wall, and the feature is the reverberation artifact, or so-called dirty shadowing, which is very typical of air in the gallbladder wall, or in fact, air anywhere. And if you're unsure, and it can be difficult sometimes with ultrasound to confidently make the diagnosis, I would have a very low threshold for going on and confirming the diagnosis, as in this case, showing gas in the gallbladder lumen and gas in the gallbladder wall. How does emphysematous cholecystitis differ simply from a gallbladder that's packed full of stones? Well, often the latter patient won't be acutely unwell, so that might be the first clue. But from an imaging perspective, we can actually see the gallbladder wall in this case as a very thin, smooth, echogenic line. And then there's a second acoustic interface, which is more irregular, which is the interface, the front edge of the stones filling the gallbladder lumen. And then look at the contrasting shadow from these calcified stones, a very clean, dark shadow. And this is the so-called wall echo shadow sign, or the west sign. And then a third gallbladder for you to consider and mull over. What's this gallbladder? Well, to me, the wall looks very similar to the case of emphysematous cholecystitis, but the teaching point is that the shadow is the important feature. And here the shadow is one of calcium. And of course, this is a calcified gallbladder wall of a porcelain gallbladder. This is an elderly patient. Uh, this was a woman on a medical floor who had a number of medical conditions and she developed right upper quadrant pain. And this is an ultrasound showing a large uh, gallstone in the region of the gallbladder fossa surrounded by uh, soft tissue. Uh, we know it's a stone because of the very clean acoustic shadow. Because of her comorbidity, she was treated uh, conservatively and returned a few days uh, later with abdominal distension and a different pain. And now we can see the stone in the gallbladder is replaced by gas. There's gas in the bile duct, and of course the stone has mi migrated and is now sitting in a mid-small bowel loop. So this, of course, is gallstone alias. And here we see that stone being delivered through an enterotomy at the time of surgery. What about pitfalls and mimics? So this is very important. This is a, a, a lovely case that was given to me a number of years ago by Dr. Wilson when we worked together in Toronto. And this is a patient who came, rule out acute cholecystitis, and we can see the gallbladder here with the lumen almost completely obliterated, but one of the thickest gallbladder walls you'll, you're likely to see, this onion peel edema of the gallbladder wall. 
And when you look at the liver, there's increased echogenicity in the periportal triads. And of course, know your patient. Speak to the patient, look at the chart. The transaminases are up in the, uh, up in the air. So this patient has acute hepatitis with secondary thickening of the gallbladder wall. This is another case. This is how it happened. Came from eMERGE, rule out acute cholecystitis, had very severe abdominal pain. We see this stone in the gallbladder neck. There are additional gall stones. The patient was very tender, but was more diffusely tender in the gallbladder than just over the gallbladder. And when we look, I would argue that this gallbladder is not tensely distended. That near wall, to me, sags into the gallbladder lumen rather than being tensely distended and pushed out. So it should cause you to look a little more carefully. And when we roll this patient left posterior oblique and look very carefully in the right upper quadrant, we can see this focal enhancement of the peritoneal stripe with a little bit of dirty shadowing behind, and this is the appearance of free air. And of course, this patient had perforated the duodenal ulcer, and there is lots of inflammation in the right upper quadrant, which also involves the gallbladder, but there's also free air. So here, the gallbladder is secondarily inflamed from a perforated duodenal ulcer. Here's another patient, rule out acute cholecystitis. The gallbladder is distended. There are no stones. There is some pericholocystic fluid. But the maximal tenderness in this case wasn't over the gallbladder. It was infralateral to the gallbladder. And when we placed the probe in the region of interest, we could see this thickened hepatic flexure of the colon with an inflamed diverticulum that's perforated. You can see that little jet of extraluminal gas. So this is acute diverticulitis of the hepatic flexure of the colon mim mimicking acute cholecystitis. Now, what about cholidocolithiasis? Uh, ultrasound sensitivities vary wildly depending on the paper, but at least 70% sensitivity, hopefully a little better than that. If the ducts are dilated, you'll do better. Harmonic imaging has Im improved uh, our uh, sensitivity. And you need to be aggressive and spend some time looking at the bile duct in various positions and with various patient uh, maneuvers. Ultrasound is highly sensitive to detect biliary dilation, as in this case. And then you must follow the ducts distally. Do the segmental ducts communicate, as they did in this case, where we see a, mar a markedly dilated common duct, but your job still isn't finished. You must follow the duct down and determine the level and cause of obstruction. And in this case, it's a large uh, stone. Just one small point. Note here that we're imaging with Sono CT. So the shadowing from that stone is not what you might expect from a large stone because of the multiple angles of in insonation, so-called dispersing the shadow. So you have to be aware of that and uh, not uh, be reluctant to make a diagnosis of a stone. If it's after hours and there's difficulty uh, accessing MRCP and you see biliary dilation on ultrasound, the patient's presentation suggests that there might be a stone, but you can't demonstrate it, then CT can be very useful, at least in our practice, where we have somewhat limited MR access out of hours. And here we see at the point of a biliary obstruction, high attenuation within the bile duct. The teaching point here is if you're going to use CT, looking at this enhanced image, you can't say if that's a stone or if it's enhancing tumor. So if you're going to use CT, you must use an unenhanced series. And then if it's a stone, it will be uh, quite obvious to you. And of course, if you have access to MRI, it's uh, very helpful. Cholangitis, pain, fever, leukocytosis, abnormal liver function, so often there's a clinical suspicion. On ultrasound, there will often be biliary dilation, and there may be thickening of the walls of the ducts, and often uh, stone disease or intervention uh, can be the cause of cholangitis. We're going to do another uh, question. A 75-year-old woman presents with septic shock, 
Clinical evidence of ascending cholangitis, the ultrasound shows biliary dilation proximal to an impacting stone in the distal common duct. What's the next most appropriate step in this woman's care? Should she have a CT with inclusion of an unenhanced series to confirm the dilation and the presence of the distal common bile duct stone? Should she have an MRCP to confirm the biliary dilation and the presence of the distal common bile duct stone? Should she have a direct referral for biliary drainage following fluid resuscitation and antibiotics? Or should she have conservative management with fluid resuscitation and antibiotics? And the answer is that if she has uh, cholangitis and you see the biliary dilation and the stone and ultrasound, once that patient's resuscitated and covered with antibiotics, she should go directly and have uh, the condition uh, treated and the bile duct strained. This is an elderly woman who presented with septic shock. We see the portal vein and immediately anteriorly a markedly dilated biliary uh, system with sludge and stones within the common duct, and that's exactly what happened. She was resuscitated, given antibiotics, and sent immediately from the ultrasound uh, department to endoscopy, where uh, this image is taken from her procedure at that time, confirming the findings. Now, a few brief words about a number of conditions, primary sclerosing cholangitis, autoimmune, can affect the intra and extra hepatic bile ducts and will ultimately lead to cirrhosis and liver failure. Uh, the definitive treatment is liver transplantation. Remember that 70% uh, of patients with PSC have ulcerative colitis and 5% of patients with ulcerative colitis will develop PSC. And if you have PSC, you have a lifetime risk of cholangiocarcinoma of 10 uh, to 15 percent. And uh, this is a nice example of PSC, very typical appearance of this smooth uh, thickening, a long segment thickening uh, of uh, the wall of the common duct. Uh, you can, of course, get skip lesions, uh, associated segmental biliary dilation. These patients come for screening ultrasound to try and look uh, and ensure that there isn't a developing cholangiocarcinoma. So you're looking for new biliary dilation, which we saw in this case uh, intrahepatically in both lobes of the liver. So again, you must follow those ducts centrally. Do they communicate? And at the level of the common duct in this case, we saw uh, material uh, polypoid uh, papillary excrescences into the common duct. So is that sludge? or is a tumor uh, and Doppler, and indeed contrast ultrasound would be very helpful here. But even with spectral Doppler, don't just rely on color. You need a spectral tracing. Uh, we could see some arterial flow, and this was a polypoid cholangiocarcinoma. Another condition to be aware of is IgG4-associated cholangitis, and the imaging features can be very similar to primary sclerosing cholangitis, the smooth uh, thickening of the wall of the common duct, and in this case, extending up into the central right and left intrahepatic uh, bile ducts. Be aware of this condition. It's uh, often associated with autoimmune pancreatitis, and indeed other autoimmune conditions. And when you're imaging these patients, look for clues on the imaging that might tip you towards an IgG4-associated uh, uh, cholangitis. It's important because unlike PSC, it's steroid responsive. So it's important to make this diagnosis. Here's another very nice example on CT, where we see the thickened uh, bile ducts, a smooth wall thickening, the uh, sausage uh, appearance to the pancreas, it's bulky, it has a slightly low attenuation, and in this case, look around the rest of the abdomen, this patient has early retroperitoneal fibrosis. So that should prompt you to consider the diagnosis and suggest that the patient have IgG4 levels obtained. Adenomyomatosis, we see this all the time. 
uh, the so-called uh, ring down artifact or comet uh, tail artifact from cholesterol crystals in the Rokitansky Ashok sinuses shown here histologically within the gallbladder wall. But I want to draw your attention to two particular types of adenomyomatosis that can sometimes cause confusion. The first I'll show you is this hourglass adenomyomatosis where you get mass-like thickening around the waist of the gallbladder. And if you look carefully here on the near wall, there are a couple of high attenuation foci. They're not uh, causing comet tail artifact, but that might make, suggest a little bit that you're dealing with adenomyomatosis. There's often stasis in the fundus. In fact, stones are often trapped in the fundus of these gallbladders. Um, we see it there in sagittal, here in transverse. We put on color Doppler. Not all color is flow. Remember I said earlier, you have to do spectral tracing. And this is twinkle artifact from cholesterol crystals in this focal thickening. So this is uh, hourglass adenomyomatosis. This is another example where you get this thickening of the gallbladder fundus. And when we look with a higher frequency uh, probe here, you can actually see an intact uh, mucosa, and, and this thickening is very typical of a fundal adenomyoma and is not a gallbladder cancer. That brings us on to gallbladder uh, polyps. Uh, here's an example of a growing polyp starting at three millimeters in 2004 and by 2013 had grown to 16 millimeters. We didn't set out to follow this polyp. It just so happens that this patient has chronic hepatitis and comes for regular screening ultrasounds for hepatocellular carcinoma. But we've watched this polyp grow, and this patient has also had multiphasic CT scans for their liver, and we can see that this polyp is enhancing. So it begs the question, at what point should we start getting concerned about this polyp, if at all? And it brings us to my final question, which is a 35-year-old woman presents with epigastric pain, and the ultrasound demonstrates a solitary 0.6-centimeter gallbladder polyp. What is the best course of action for this finding? Should the patient be referred to the surgeon? No need for follow-up or other action. Follow-up ultrasound initially in six months or recommend CT or MRI to rule out a gallbladder cancer? The right answer probably is no need for follow-up or other action. And one paper that supports this approach is uh, Kerwin et al. in radiology in 2011. And they had 346 incidental polyps on ultrasound. 43% of those polyps had ultrasound follow-up for a number of years. 12% of patients had cholecystectomy, and 45% had clinical follow-up for a number of years. 81% of their polyps, the vast majority, were small, 1 to 6 millimeters. 15% were 7 to 9 millimeters, and only 4% were greater than 10 millimeters. They had no cancers at all in their series of 346 polyps. And of the patients who had cholecystectomy, there were only three neoplastic polyps, all benign, measuring 7, 12, and 18 millimeters. And in their series, only one polyp showed growth on ultrasound, uh, and it grew from 3 to 5 millimeters over a period of four years. Their recommendations, and recommendations I've uh, seen and heard from uh, other discussions and other papers are for smaller polyps, dismiss them. Their recommendations were seven to nine millimeters follow with ultrasound. I'm not sure I always do that, particularly in older patients. If I had a, an 88-year-old woman with a, a seven or an eight millimeter gallbladder polyp, I probably wouldn't recommend follow up. But where you get interested are probably the larger polypoid masses, and particularly in younger patients, and perhaps it is a good idea to get a surgical referral for them. And here's an example. This was a case in our practice where we saw this 2.3-centimeter polypoid gallbladder mass. 
uh, we can see it there. We put on uh, spectral color and spectral Doppler. Clearly, that's a vascular mass. Uh, we raise concern quite strongly about that polypoid mass. The surgeon uh, elected to get an MRI to confirm the findings. I'm not sure really what the MR adds here. But either the patient declined surgery or was lost to follow up. I haven't been able to establish which and came back with this obstruction of the right uh, colon from an invasive cancer involving the hepatic flexure. And if you look carefully, lateral to that ascending colon, likely tumor seeding in the paracolic gutter. So you have to have some concern when you see larger polypoid gallbladder masses. It's a, it's a judgment thing. This is a case from a, around the same time. There's echogenic material within the gallbladder uh, neck here. Uh, it could be sludge, but again, use Doppler, use contrast ultrasound, and we see this is a vascular mass. And this patient uh, had a CT scan for staging. We see it is indeed a vascular mass, and this is another gallbladder cancer. And this patient is doing well four years post-surgery. Remember, be slow to diagnose uh, acute, uncomplicated uh, calculus cholecystitis if the gallbladder is not tensely distended. Look for the obstructing stone. Remember always underlying gallbladder cancers. If you think there might be a cancer, alert your surgeon. Air versus uh, calcium, it's the shadowing that will make that distinction. ERCP directly, if you see an obstructing stone in the common duct on ultrasound, there's no need to do additional imaging. Unenhanced CT, if you decide to do CT because you can't visualize a suspected stone with ultrasound, remember IgG4 associated cholangitis. It can mimic PSC and it's steroid responsive, so you don't want to miss the diagnosis. Small gallbladder polyps you can dismiss.